Good morning and good afternoon and good evening to those of you who have joined in. We're already up to 110 attendees, which is fantastic. My name is Jeff Abramson. I'm a senior fellow at the Arms Control Association and also the director and one of the founders of the Forum on the Arms Trade. The Forum on the Arms Trade is a co-host and delighted to co-host today's event. We're a network of more than 110 experts and emerging experts around the world who work on the implications of the arms trade, security assistance, and weapons use. That's all I'm going to say about the Forum. This isn't about me, but I did want to tell you very briefly a little about the technology we'll be using. We have turned on the Q&A for this session. Uh, given the numbers of people that are uh, joining as attendees, we're not going to enable the chat. We just feel it might be a little bit too difficult to keep track of all that. But please do use the Q&A function. You should also be able to um, upvote the questions you see. So if there's the, the ones that look particularly interesting to you, please do hit that like or happy button uh, so that we can get a feel for that. But this, uh, I would like to quickly now turn it over to the partners who helped with this report. And I'm gonna introduce Bridget Conley, who is the research director at the World Peace Foundation to talk a little bit more about that. Hi, thank you, Jeff. And thank you so much for co-host or for hosting this um, event for us. So as Jeff noted, I'm Bridget Conley. I'm the research director at the World Peace Foundation. Um, and just a brief note, World Peace Foundation uh, was created in 1910 with a gift by, uh, from Edwin Ginn. Um, he was a textbook publisher. Uh, he was also a contemporary of Carnegie's um, and part of the movement at the turn of the century that believed that world peace could actually be brought about, that war could be definitively ended. Um, Disarmament was one of the key issues that that movement um, focused on, and we have reinterpreted that historical interest in, in the arms trade with a contemporary project that we've been working on for several years, largely focused around corruption and the arms trade, and we've done several projects on that. This project, though, which was conceived by my colleague, Sam Perlo Freeman, who worked with us for several years and is now with Campaign Against the Arms Trade um, in the UK, but um, is, is really an intellectual leader of the project that uh, brings you this report today. That project is called Defense Industries, Foreign Policy and Armed Conflict. The project is funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And we are working in partnership with the Center for Responsive Politics on this project. We are asking with this project why, despite robust regulations in key countries, key exporting countries, and international monitoring efforts, has the global arms trade proven so resistant to effective controls? And that resistance has made it has direct enabling consequences on conflict situations. We're together today to note the first major report from our side of the project. The Center for Responsive Politics issued a report just last week on um, lobbying and revolving doors between industry, defense department and um, Congress. And, and I invite you all to take a look at their website. Today, we will be talking about the first research report that our side of the project has put out. Um, and this is a report authored by Samuel Perlo, uh, Sam Perlo Freeman called Business as Usual. And the title will give you an indication of what his research has taken him on this project. Again, we are very pleased that all of you decided to endure yet one more Zoom event. Um, and we think it will be well worth your time. So with that, I'd like to hand over management of the program to our moderator, Nathan Toronto. Thank you very much, Bridget. And, and thank you, Jeff. Uh, this is, I, I'm, I'm excited to, to be part of this event. Uh, I am the commissioning editor at the Program on Civil Military Relations in Arab States, CMRAS which is a program based at the Malcolm H. Kerr Carnegie Middle East Center. And so the, the implications of this, of this report are of personal interest to me as it relates to, to the Middle East, um, um, but also in, as a researcher of civil military relations and battlefield effectiveness, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to, to see where the discussion goes. 
the I'm going to introduce the 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 panelists and then turn it over to get us started because I know that's what you're really here for. Uh, Sam Perler Freeman is the author of the report, as Bridget said. He's also the research coordinator at Campaign Against the Arms Against Arms Trade and a senior fellow with the World Peace Foundation. Uh, his work focuses on the political economy of the global arms industry, corruption in the arms trade, and on understanding and using data in the global arms trade. Uh, for the panelists, uh, Dan Mahanti is the director of the U.S. program for the Center for Civilians in Conflict. And through research and advocacy, he promotes the adoption of U.S. government policies and practices that serve to limit the harm experienced by civilians in armed conflict. Molly Mulready is a lawyer, uh, formerly of the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office. She served as the lead lawyer defending the British government in litigation put forward by Campaign Against Arms Trade regarding arms sales to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And finally, Emma Soubrier is a visiting scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Uh, she's also an associate researcher at the Centre Michel de l'Hôpital, Université Clermont Auvergne. Uh, apologies for the bad French accent. Uh, and she is a fellow with the World Peace Foundation. Her research focuses on security, political economy, and the arms trade in the Middle East, particularly in the Gulf region. Sam will present his paper for uh, 15 minutes and followed by the remaining three panelists with, with five minutes each. After that, uh, we will open it up for uh, the, the Q&A. We'll start discussing the questions in, in the Q&A. So please submit your questions. Sam, over to you. Thank you very much, Jeff, Bridget, and Nathan. And thank you to everyone uh, for coming. Um, so I am going to uh, sh share some slides for this. Uh, let's see if we can get that to work. Hope everyone can see that. Um, so Bridget's introduced uh, this project uh, already. Just to say a bit more about what this report is covering and what the subsequent reports that are coming for this project will co cover. The report I'm gonna discuss with you today is really, if you like, just the facts, ma'am. It's, it's a look at the data on arms exports and conflicts and um, just the what of, to what extent are the major arms exporters selling arms to countries involved in conflict. The second stage of the project uh, is going to look a lot more at the why, though I'm sure that, that will be discussed in the, by the discussants and in the Q&A subsequently today. So we are going to have three in-depth case studies on the US, UK and France um, by members of the project team, uh, looking uh, at the policy drivers, the role of the, the defense industry, the role of public opinion, the role of foreign policy interest. So uh, my colleagues, colleagues, Jennifer Erickson for the US, Anna Stavrianakis for the UK, and Emma Soubrier, who's with us today uh, for France, will be leading those. Um, so I'm uh, talking in this report about just what the data tells us about arms supplies to conflict. Um, I'll start with a little bit of framing about why countries export and why they might choose not to export. So for major arms producers, there, there's a lot of reasons why they might want to export arms. First of all, maintaining an advanced arms industry is an extremely expensive, capital-intensive business. Um, and so... Uh, that there may not be a very high level of domestic orders, especially if you're anyone other than the United States. And so maintaining all that capabilities, the technology, the infrastructure, and the know-how between limited domestic orders uh, is, can be difficult. And so exports can help sustain that as well as spreading unit costs. There's a belief that arms sales can help offer foreign policy influence with customers. It can help cement relationships. There is also a belief or a claim that exports support jobs and the economy. 
me and colleagues have done a lot about how that is massively exaggerated and it's actually not a great way of creating and supporting jobs. But at any rate, it seems to be something that's widely believed or at least claimed. Now, what about the reverse? Why might countries choose not to export? Most obviously, stopping arms supplies to enemies and rivals. Also, maintaining control over your most advanced and sensitive technologies, and especially, of course, non-proliferation of WMD is often a major concern. Then there's the potential for blowback from unintended consequences, conflicts arising like the first Gulf War between Iran and Iraq, the Iraq invasion of Kuwait. And finally, which is perhaps most of interest here, especially since the end of the Cold War, there's been growing pressure from civil society, public opinion, the international community over the conflict, the humanitarian and human rights implications of the arms trade. But what this may lead to, as my colleague Jer Jennifer Erickson and also Anastasia Knuckers has have argued, is um, a gap between rhetoric and reality and a gap between commitment to arms control measures like the arms trade treaty that look very strong on paper and then the implementation of those in actual practical decision making. And so to what extent is that the case is what we're exploring today. They've, many countries have made commitments on export controls that look like it ought to stop arms being sold uh, where they will exacerbate conflict. And yet they seem to go on. So first to briefly talk about the data, the data we're using uh, in this report is CIPRI data on transfers of major conventional weapons, uh, which is the only comprehensive global source of such data. But it does leave out a lot, small arms and light weapons, components and most subsystems, military services. It's also because financial data isn't always available, it's, it's CIPRI's own bespoke measure of the volume of transfers. You can never interpret it in dollar quantities. There is also national data for some of our countries, um, but not all. Uh, we've done some work on that, but, but that uh, is not what I'll be talking about uh, in, in this report, just the CIPRI data for which we have data for all our top 11 exporters based on CIPRI data. For armed conflict, we've used the Uppsala Conflict Data Project which uh, is the longest consistent series that stretches back at least to 1989. And what we first of all focused on is conflicts which, according to Uppsala, reached the status of war uh, in at least one year, starting in 2000 up to 2018, or similar levels of one-sided violence against civilians. And there were 30 of these conflicts uh, which, which reached the level of war in at least one year. Um, only a couple of them were international state-on-state -state conflicts, the invasion of Iraq by the US, UK and Australia, the Ethiopia and Eritrea war, but an awful lot, about half of them, had some degree of international involvement, so they weren't purely inter internal. And some of these, Afghanistan, DRC, um, Somalia, Syria, Uganda, and Yemen are some of the examples where there's been most international interventions, so what sometimes called internationalized armed conflicts. So the first thing that I did is just look at which of these conflicts have uh, the major arms exporters sold arms into or participated in, the, in themselves, of course. Um, so by selling arms to a conflict, I mean by selling arms to any of the participants in the conflict in a year that they were involved and when it reached the status of war. And here's the, the basic table uh, of just counting the conflicts that, um, that these countries have been involved in or armed. And um, we can see that they, they've all supplied arms to quite a significant number of conflicts. Uh, I categorized arms supplies as major or minor based on some arbitrary thresholds, but you have to cut it off somewhere, of course. Um, we can see that Russia stands out here as the uh, 
the biggest supplier, but um, especially with as major suppliers, but all have supplied to at least some. And apart from the Netherlands, all of these 11 have either been involved in or supplied at least some arms to at least half or more of the uh, 30 conflicts that we considered. To give a bit more detail on this, um, we, I have a, uh, if I can find it, uh, here we go. No, uh, is that the one I want? Yes, it is. Um, so this is um, a table of which uh, conflicts each exporter has supplied arms to. You can see more of it in the report. Um, there's some which absolutely everyone or virtually everyone has supplied lots of arms to. Yemen, by which I mean not necessarily supplying arms to Yemen, but to one of the participants in the war. Everyone supplied at least some, and most have supplied a lot of arms, the dark red there. Some like, one Liberia, no one supplied arms. None of the top 11 supplied arms into that conflict, at least by direct means. Of course, all sorts of brokerage and smuggling was going on. There's some where like, if you look at DRC, there was an arms embargo on DRC itself and most countries for the most part kept to it. But a lot of countries supplied at least some arms to the other countries that were involved in what was sometimes called Africa's First World War. So even some of the cases where the international community was promoting restraint, um, that, that restraint was a bit leaky. And to go on to, uh, obviously I can't go through every line of that table as it's rather a lot to look at, but to go uh, back to the presentation and talk about some of the key conclusions that came out from this element of the study. Basically, very little evidence of war or arms conflict leading to restraint in arms transfers by the major uh, exporters. Uh, as I said, all exported substantial arms supplies to at least some of the wars. And more over, there were very few cases where export, if any, where exporters stopped selling arms to a significant customer uh, when war broke out. Um, so when they didn't sell arms to a war, it's usually because they just weren't selling arms to that country anyway, for whatever reason, very often because the country, especially the poorer countries in Africa or some in Asia, were just not big buyers of major conventional weapons anyway. Um, or sometimes it was because a prior political relationship precluded uh, uh, arms sales, for example, when uh, countries were rivals or certain countries falling in the sort of sphere of influence of USA or China or whoever. There's perhaps some evidence of what one might call selective restraint in low stakes cases. So maybe exporters were choose, some exporters were choosing not to supply arms in certain conflicts where they could do so without great loss to their arms industry, where there wasn't much of a market opportunity for them in any case. Um, so I've, I've talked about some of these patterns uh, already. So I'll move on to the second part of this data analysis, which was some statistical regression analysis. This took me uh, the field back further to 1990, and it looked not just at the countries at war, but all countries for which I could get data, 162 countries. And so it's um, a big statistical analysis of the factors influencing whether or not each of the exporters would sell arms to a given recipient in a particular year. So that includes war and minor armed conflict falling short of war, but also a lot of factors that could affect demand. So their level of military spending, the level of arms that they were receiving from everyone else apart from the country that we were looking at, um, their, level, their overall level of GDP. 
Um, so basically I was including as many control variables as possible to try to isolate as far as possible the specific effect of war and, uh, uh, or armed conflict on the willingness of each exporter to supply. So this analysis was conducted for each, in, um, for each exporter in turn. There will be more of the methodology and the, the detailed uh, regression econometric results put up on the website. Um, I've, I've included uh, uh, some tables here of what, what was relevant. Um, I don't have time to go through this, but the main conclusion, the things that really determined uh, whether arms supplies happened was first of all, whether a recipient was a recent customer. Arms sales relationships tend to be ongoing. So if a country has already been selling arms, they tend to continue it. And not surprisingly, this is not a revelation, but it's an important control variables. Uh, the level of military spending by a country uh, affected the likelihood and also their overall level of arms ex import. So if a country is buying arms from everyone else in large quantities, then they're probably also buying arms from the country that we're looking at as well. But the thing that's of interest for the purpose of this is that I never found a negative impact of conflict on the probability of armed supplies taking place for any of the exporters. Um, sometimes there was the reverse. Sometimes there was a positive effect. Uh, Russia, for example, was more likely to supply arms to countries at war, Israel and France more likely to supply arms to countries in, involved in minor armed conflict, but never the reverse of conflict acting as a clear, significant restraining factor. And so I, I think that's the bottom of this line of this study, the lack of any evidence, though I look pretty hard um, for conflict at being an impediment to arms supplies for any of our 11 exporting countries. So I will finish there, hopefully only slightly over my 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. Okay, we'll move over to the panelists. We'll start with uh, Dan. Thanks so much, Nathan. and. Uh, Thanks so much to um, to Sam and Bridget and everybody else who was involved in this project. Um, you know, obviously, uh, just based on the findings of the report, um, it's pretty clear that uh, there's never been a better time to kind of shock, uh, you know, the system into recognizing, um, you know, some of the conclusions that you've drawn through your analysis. So really want to commend you on an important contribution. And also just make a, a kind of side note of how important it seems to me right now that we have something called the World Peace Foundation. I mean, it sounds almost like... Uh, something out of science fiction, like the organization that's going to help us defeat the evil forces uh, of war in the world. So uh, congrats for getting a monopoly on uh, what is a, a really cool name for an organization. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, thanks for having me. Um, great to see, uh, you know, all of the, uh, the those of you that are on the participants list, including a number of, of current and former colleagues and fellow travelers uh, in this space who have done a lot of really important critical work in this area. Um, good to see you. Uh, and also just an honor to be uh, here with um, with my co-panelists. And I'm excited to offer a couple of thoughts, but then also uh, to participate in what I'm sure will be uh, a really um, great discussion or, uh, about the report and some of the implications it, it, um, it brings to the table. Um, the first thing I want to offer by way of just a general reflection on the report um, is how I found that the findings, you know, take it to, taken together, uh, really betray a remarkable level of indifference by UN member states, uh, including members of the Security Council, uh, to the connection, the enduring connection between the proliferation of weapons transfers and the prevalence and, and duration of war, but also the effects uh, of war and those weapons on, on civilians and armed conflict. And I also thought very, um, you know, kind of compellingly illustrated, uh, you know, the problem uh, that exists uh, with not recognizing the limits of the international and domestic uh, controls through laws and regulation and policies that are that are currently in place. And we'll talk, I'm sure, a little bit uh, more about that. But um, to me, it's a little bit of a wake up call. Um, you know, today there was a report, I believe, and in, in maybe reported by The Guardian um, from our, our colleagues. At, and I think the, our colleagues at um, 
um, from other NGOs made reference to the fact that fewer uh, folks had been, fewer people had been killed in the last year as a result of explosive weapons and armed conflict. But it's a, you know it's somewhat of an anomaly because I think the general trend uh, certainly shows that for at least the last ten years. Um, there's a clear and direct relationship between the proliferation of the kinds of weapons that are covered by this report uh, and the number of non-combatants and civilians that are that are killed. And so, um, you know, really important that we remember that, again, apart from the kind of policy and legal issues that that you raise, you know, recalling what you said at the outset, which is that um, there's a very human consequence to uh, to the findings of the report. Um, you know, certainly in the case of the U.S., and I'm glad to hear that there will be a U.S. specific case study coming. It's an area where we've spent quite a bit of time, along with uh, counterparts and colleagues at the Stimson Center, looking at, um, you know, the, the U.S. arms transfer regime and kind of ways that, um, you know, controls work effectively or, or don't and what can be done, um, you know, to limit the, the negative and unanticipated consequences of arms transfers. Um, because I definitely think, you know, if nothing else, your examination of the U.S. shows that the intent of the stated intent of the Arms Export Control Act and all the regulations that stem from it um, are not being met with the current uh, regime of controls. So I wanted to offer a couple of thoughts, maybe you know, in anticipation of what your case study may find, um, you know, in terms of what some plausible uh, explanations might be for um, the status quo in the United States, and then maybe offer a couple of thoughts on what the new administration uh, can do about it. Because after all, um, I am a policy advocate, and so I don't want to lose an opportunity to make a couple of points, uh, but I'll try to be brief. Um, you referenced a couple of these things, or maybe teased them, Sam, and I'm sure they'll they'll feature in your next report. But in the U.S. specifically, um, you know, of course, there's the direct relationship the U.S. plays with respect to a number of armed conflicts around the world, which helps to explain, I think, the um, the arms transfers relationship. But I also think in the U.S. and maybe more so even than some of your other case studies, um, arms sales really have become the indispensable, uh, you know, American diplomatic currency of choice in a number of countries. And, and that's a, a term that I borrowed from somebody else who I'm sure is, is listening. I can't remember who coined that, but, um, you know, Arms sales actually serve as kind of our, our, our the way that we've we not only assume that we have political influence, but it's the means by which we undertake transactional diplomacy in a, in a kind of a problematic way. Um, and as a side sort of characteristic of that phenomenon, um, arms sales have a particular stickiness to them. In other words, just as you uh, mentioned in your report, once you undertake an arms transfer relationship, um, it sort of becomes a, um, you know, a constant in a relationship that's really hard to undo. Um, Egypt is a perfect example of this. I know a lot of attention has been placed on Saudi Arabia recently, but if you look at the arms transfers to Egypt, they start to make less and less sense if you were to start from a baseline zero. But if you look at arms sales in the context of, you know, a 40 year relationship, and you look at all of the, you know, the strands that bind the US to Egypt through arms sales, you can see how difficult it is to to undo those, um, you know, arm sales is a major feature of the bilateral relationship. Um, it's sort of been set cynically as the, the price of diplomatic cooperation uh, between the two countries, not just to pick on Egypt, but just as an example. Um, another variable I think that would be really interesting to examine, which you um, preview perhaps in this report, which may be further explored in the next, is I think a certain degree of overconfidence in the existing safeguards, both the uh, the legal safeguards and regulatory safeguards, but also policy safeguards. And I'll call attention to the 2014 uh, Obama era conventional arms transfer policy, which has some great, um, you know, rhetor rhetorical um, emphasis on human rights and international humanitarian law. Um, but at the end, even atrocities prevention. But at the end of the day, whether or not it served as an effective filter uh, for conventional arms transfers uh, during that um, that period is, I think, subject to debate. Um, and then I'll finally just uh, mention the fact that um, you know another unique feature of the United States is that it's it's currently undertaking um, you know arms sales in a number of places where conflict has not yet taken place or or is not yet you know a, a prevalent uh, you know approximate risk, um, but because of the volume and the the number of countries with whom the United States has a major arms sales relationship, um, you know from my perspective you know the U.S. and, and some of the other countries you mentioned have literally. Uh, impregnated the world with the arms that will be used in, in future conflict, which is another uh, factor to consider in, in the analysis. So what might the new administration actually do about stemming some of the trends that you identify in the report and that we've called attention to separately? 
Um, you know, number one, I think diversifying away from arms sales as a form of diplomacy uh, in its most important relationships and finding other ways of expressing support and strengthening uh, the terms of compatibility with, uh, with America's most important partners to avoid the kind of lightning rod effect that arms sales have had, but also to avoid the humanitarian consequences. Um, we've talked a lot in the past with many on this call about the importance of strengthening uh, congressional oversight, if nothing else, to add that additional uh, permission set, that that additional layer of scrutiny and that additional hurdle to, uh, you know, the overwhelming ease with which arms are currently transferred. Um, I think as we've discussed in the past, a third, or as I mentioned earlier, a third uh, step that could be taken is to make some of these filters that are applied in advance of arms sales um, a little bit more meaningful in practice to actually test some of the controls um, you know, before arms transfers take place to, to ensure that they're actually serving a meaningful constraining role and not just um, something we can point to as, um, you know, as, as good rhetoric. Um, and then finally, um, part of the importance or part of the way that you have a stronger control regime on the front end is by making sure you have a stronger control regime uh, on the back end and strengthening the terms of, you know, the arms transfers agreements in advance um, and really improving the capacity to, to monitor and control uh, weapons once they've been transferred, um, you know, especially in the in the event that they start um, being employed in armed conflict, is something that I think um, is an area of where there's vast improvements available. So, I've very likely gone over my allotted five minutes. Um, so I apologize, but I'll give it back to the group uh, in discussion and defer uh, maybe some of the Q and A uh, to the other panelists. So there's some some initial thoughts. But thanks again for having me. Uh, thanks, Dan. You know, those those thoughts on policy prescriptions uh, are definitely worth thinking about, and not just in terms of what the administration could do, but what will it do, uh, I think is a question that a lot of people are asking. So that's something we should get to in Q&A. Um, all right, I'll pass the time now to uh, Molly Mulready. Five minutes. Thank you so much. Um, it's very good to be here and thank you to all for having me. I feel like I'm uh, for once I'm with the good guys with all of you. So it definitely feels good. Um, I wanted to start with um, one sentence that stuck out for me in Sam's excellent paper. And it's this getting states to sign up to stronger export controls is one thing but getting them to implement them in practice, especially when it comes to important customers, requires a lot more work. And I just couldn't agree more with that sentence. I think it's a truth across so much of the interface between what the policy is said to be, what the law is said to be, and what actually happens in reality. And the majority of the power, I would argue, is with those who implement the law, not those who vote on what it should say. Those people have a role, of course, particularly if the ones voting on the law are the same as those deciding whether and to what extent to comply with it. But in an international law setting, which we're partly, though not completely in with the arms trade, if the law says the government must do X and a government, particularly one of the P5, decides to do Y, what are you gonna do? Call the police? From the UN, at the very most, you'll get a Security Council resolution but that will have the inevitable watering down from whatever Security Council member has a vested interest. Or you could try your luck at the International Criminal Court, provided you're armed with expensive lawyers, having gathered extensive evidence, often from dangerous, inaccessible places, and up against the full might of a powerful government that doesn't want to be investigated. Now, I'm not completely pessimistic. I think there are routes to accountability. They are there but they're so infrequently felt by the powerful politicians and officials who propagate the arms trade, that so far they seem to be able to break the law with almost complete impunity. And in my view, nowhere is that more apparent at the moment than in the sale of arms from the UK and the US to Saudi Arabia for use on the people of Yemen. Now, my role in relation to that, and I remain ashamed of it, which is in part why I'm always keen to speak at events like this to try and serve a sort of warning to not leave your morals at the door into your workplace as I did. Um, my job was to provide legal advice to the British Foreign Secretary on the export of arms to the Middle East. Part of that meant responding to the litigation brought by a campaign against the arms trade, challenging the legality of arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Now, CAT was successful at the appeal court, but even then, our court having found that the government had acted unlawfully in continuing to license the exports, I'm not sure that any arms transfers were actually prevented. I think at best what was achieved was a delay. 
Now, the law says, as Sam sets out in his paper, that the UK government should refuse an export license where there's a clear risk the items to be licensed might, only might, low threshold, be used in a serious violation of international humanitarian law. And I think at the start of the conflict in Yemen, there were arguments to say that clear risk threshold wasn't met. So that's where I might slightly part company with perhaps the thrust of Sam's paper, which is the one would expect a halt in arms sales when war breaks out, because when comparing a state of no war with a state of war, it's obviously in the latter state that there are greater risks when it comes to IHL compliance. You don't need to worry about whether someone is complying with the laws of war when there is no war. Obvious point. However, I'd argue, and you know, maybe my government lawyer is showing, um, but whilst the risk is certainly increased at the start of a conflict when compared to there being no conflict at all, at the outset of a conflict such as the one in Yemen, when you've got an abundance, when you've not got an abundance of evidence about how the Saudis have conducted air campaigns in previous armed conflicts, you know, the Royal Saudi Air Force has not seen active service in the theatre of war very often, you could say there's not sufficient evidence to say there's a clear risk those weapons might be used in a serious violation. Of course, as ever with the law, there are opposing arguments, such as in this context, you could perhaps extrapolate from the Saudi general approach to human life, the retaining of the death penalty, um, maybe a close scrutiny of previous military activity, albeit years previously, that maybe you could predict that IHL compliance would not be on point. There are arguments both ways on this, I think, most of the time at the start of a conflict. And if there are credible arguments, both that there is a clear risk, and so exports are unlawful, and credible arguments that there's not a clear risk, and so exports are lawful, and you're the government, and you want to carry on exporting, you will of course choose the self-serving legal analysis, the one that supports your policy. However, as conflicts run on, and governments gather more and more evidence about how the destination country is conducting itself in warfare, like the British government has done in relation to the Saudis, that line becomes more and more difficult to hold. When you start at the beginning with a blank sheet of paper, you can look yourself in the mirror and say, you know, the risk is low enough for this to be lawful. But when you're five years in, and your piece of paper has over 500 incidents of IHL concern written on it, with probably around a third of those attributed to the Saudi-led coalition. And when you've got incidents like the funeral hall incident, which happened in 2016, which many would argue is clearly a war crime, it becomes extremely difficult, and I would argue impossible in good faith, to hold that line that there's no clear risk and that the exports are lawful. And so I will conclude by saying, asking, where does this get us? Um, and I have obviously, I've thought about this a lot, um, particularly since I left the Foreign Office and, you know, particularly feeling a, a sort of moral responsibility about all of this work. Um, and, and where I've got to is that without accountability, the law is just words on a page. Um, and as the criminal law often disproportionately disbenefits poor people, and tax laws often disproportionately benefit wealthy people. So public international law, in particular international humanitarian law, applies differently to you, depending on where you have the good luck or bad luck to sit in the hierarchy of the value of human lives when measured against the importance of profit. And until that changes, and I leave you with a pessimistic note, until that changes, I think sadly this situation will remain. Well, thank you, Molly, uh, for your assessment, and um, definitely something we should consider uh, in with clear eyes uh, in all sides of the, of the issue. The, the issue of implementation and accountability uh, crucially important, I think, in this case, as you've as you mentioned. Uh, I'll turn the time now to Emma uh, for her comments. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much, uh, Nathan, and thank you, Sam, uh, for such a compelling report. Uh, I really found the report extremely interesting uh, because it puts, as uh, others have said, numbers on ideas that experts of the global arms trade are already familiar with. Um, I would argue that none would be incredibly surprised by the conclusions of this study, 
but um, being able to quantify this is truly valuable. Um, I was looking at it through uh, two different prism, uh, one being my area of research, the Gulf region, and the other one being the French experts, uh, as I will be in charge of the French uh, case study and the following steps of the collective research. Uh, and in that double capacity, um, there were a few points that I found particularly interesting. Um, as um, I, I would like to, one, one thing that was really uh, extremely striking to me was the overall conclusion of uh, the report, uh, page 20. It, it says that arm cells largely follow the demand and are often dependent on established relationships between buyer and seller which sellers are typically reluctant to abandon, regardless of concerns over the potential impact uh, on conflict. And in that regard, France is a perfect illustration of this overall conclusion. Um, as is noted in the report, um, France armed most conflicts, uh, though there were a number of cases where this only occurred during years of minor armed conflicts. And France, like Germany, um, has its largest arms sales uh, to high demand countries. So you see France being pretty much a perfect illustration of the overall report. Uh, in short, France didn't sell when it was already not selling and continued doing so when there was an established relationship regardless of whether or not these countries were involved in conflict. Um, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are good examples of this. Um, I would say it is, however, worth noting uh, the evolution of orders put, uh, arms order put over that decade uh, and the difference between the two countries. Uh, while arms sales uh, remain significant to both, uh, there is a somewhat important drop after 2015. In the case of uh, Saudi Arabia, if you look at, I know, uh, Sam, you've used the, the Rapport au Parlement, the, the report for Parliament that uh, comes out every year uh, for, for France. And if you look at the, the evolution of uh, the orders put um, by Saudi Arabia, you, you do see a drop in number. Regardless of this, uh, there is a drop in numbers, but there is a stable proportion, which the Cypri numbers tells you. Uh, basically, France remained at about 5% about of total uh, Saudi arms imports, which I find really interesting if you compare it to, let me pull it right now. Um, if, you, if you compare the five years of 2010 to 2014 to uh, 2015 to 2019, the US exports went from 41% of the Saudi imports to 73%. Um, in France, uh, France export went from 5.5% to 4.3%. So re re relatively uh, stable, uh, regardless of the drop in, in numbers, in overall numbers that I mentioned. Um, going back to the, to the uh, general rule, that is, they continue to sell or not sell uh, with no impact whatsoever of uh, armed conflict. The report notes that there is one exception to this uh, with Egypt. Uh, it says Egypt has become a particularly major cust customer in recent years, coinciding uh, with its involvement in the Yemen war. And indeed, if you look at the curves of French arms deliveries to uh, Cairo, it confirms this. It is also uh, important to underline though, that there is, um, that. It, I, I would argue that it's important to look at when the orders there again were put, um, it, they were put in 2014 and 2015, and the, the spike in number came from the Rafale, as we know, obviously, and frigates, the Gowind and the Mistral. Uh, this happened in a context of strained relations with the United States after the coup uh, that was not qualified as such in the summer of 2014. Of course, a lot could be said about that. But the point is that it challenges the idea that the surge in French uh, arms export had anything to do with Yemen. Um, and another remark is that this 
uh, streamlining uh, by conflict kind of puts uh, Egypt and Yemen at the same level as Saudi Arabia and the UAE, when really the involvement of Egypt in the Yemen war was arguably pretty minimal, if not nominal. Um, so um, on, on this, uh, also on this idea that the data needs further qualitative uh, discussion, um, I, I would say another really interesting example is Qatar. There is uh, a major surge in arms import uh, in 2014, 2015, and it could be deemed to be related to Yemen there again. Um, but then uh, I would argue as, a, as an observer of the region that it could, that it was most likely due to the tensions amidst, amidst the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, from March to November, 2014, that were aggravated in June, 2015 with the beginning of the Gulf crisis, for instance. Um, so to be fair, the report does point to political factors as an important determinant in whether there will be minor to major arms sales to a given country. As it turns out, I would say geopolitical crisis and tensions may explain the rise or the fluctuations in demand as much as armed conflict, which means that those fly under the radar uh, while possibly uh, determining the demand more and hence the trade since um, another, another really important point in the report is um, I think it's page 19, it confirms that uh, arms sales relationship tend to be ongoing and that recipients overall demand for arms is the key factor in whether they will receive arms from any individual supplier. Um, so that, yeah, those are my uh, preliminary remarks and they do of course not uh, throw any shade on the importance and value of this report. As I said in the beginning, I think, I think it's extremely valuable. If anything, I would say it simply opens up questions that will precisely be covered at length in the case studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, now, before we move to, to Q&A, uh, I'm actually going to ask all the panelists to turn their video on. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask if anybody has any responses or uh, reactions to the comments. Uh, Sam, this is your, your, your chance to, to respond if you'd like, or others could respond to some of the comments that you've uh, mm. put out there. Yes, just briefly. I think as Emma has hinted, the, the report in many cases uh, us and Molly to, uh, as well ask, uh, raises more questions than it answers. Um, it's, a, it's a starting point. It doesn't distinguish between different conflicts of why a country is involved in a conflict. Is it acting in absolutely necessary self-defense, for example, in some cases? Um, or, um, you, you know, what exactly is the conduct of the conflict? It, it's just looking at the, the overall pictures and numbers. And of course, you can break this down more detailed. I think in response to Emma's point, I, I, I would say, yes, uh, this is exactly what I'm finding, that it's not the conflict that it's, that's the cause necessarily of the arms sales. It's just it doesn't make any difference either way. It didn't stop the arms sales either, and neither did human rights or anything else. Um, so, so yes, it's uh, when when there seems to be spikes, uh, it's uh, it, at one time or another. The conflict probably isn't what the uh, what, what the government is thinking about. We must help Egypt defeat the Houthis, uh, but it's also not. Oh, um, this conflict is really bad. We ought not to be exacerbating it. So it it just does not, in most cases, seem to be a factor either way. All right. Thanks, Sam. Any other comments? Great. So uh, there's some there's some really interesting questions here uh, that we that I think we should get to. The first I think has to do with a foreign policy and the relationship between foreign policy and uh, the arms trade. Uh, on the one hand, there seems to be uh, this this idea that arms our arms uh, exports give access or they're the sort of a tool of foreign policy and that's sort of a motivation uh, for for creating that relationship. Um, 
and I, I'm so I mean, it makes me wonder: is is this a, a business set of decisions? Is this really business as usual, or is this um, the it's just arms exports following foreign policy agendas? Uh, so I'll, I'll throw that out to the, the, the panel. So we'll start with Sam to respond, and then the other three can chime in as you see fit. I, I, I'd uh, like to give, give the, the others uh, uh, the option to go first, and then I'll see if I have anything to, to add, if that's, if that's okay. I've said lots. Um. Hi, yeah, I can jump in um, on this. It, thank you. That is an excellent question. I mean, a lot of um, works that we see on arm cells, arm shade, uh, do put forward what are the arguments for the, the selling uh, countries, right? And this argument of the influence is, is a recurring one. Um, it is um, looking, for instance, at the Gulf region, it is true that uh, not only arms sales, but also defense cooperation agreements uh, are usually, they, they are associated with, um, you know, uh, building military bases in these countries. And uh, there is this, uh, this idea that it provides influence to the seller. Um, I would argue that maybe this uh, this this idea was truer uh, in in a moment such as uh, the Cold War, because you had a clear opposition of two uh, major powers that were trying to gain influence in a bipolar uh, world, uh, which is to say that there was really something. Um, that there was more in for the sellers than for the, the recipients of arm sales. When you look at uh, the Gulf states today, and that's something that I, that I actually discuss in, in my work, is really who does it, does it uh, give influence to? In a context where, for instance, the Gulf, is, um, the Gulf region is one of the most important regions in terms of receiving arms from all over the world. Uh, all major manufacturing countries want to sell to the Gulf states, basically. And so in this context, there is actually, uh, we are facing a, a, a situation in which the Gulf countries actually um, are, are interested in using this as leverage for their own uh, interest. And I would say that it actually plays into the influence of the Gulf countries rather than uh, the, the, their Western suppliers. Obviously, that is a question open for debate, but I would say that more and more this argument of whether or not it gives us influence is at least uh, questionable. And I would add that not only is it questionable that, that we would have influence, but I will add that we're not really trying to actually use that influence uh, if, if there is uh, influence whatsoever. Mm. Can I come in on that? also if that's okay um and i totally agree with the point that emma made at the end you know if it does get us all this influence i mean what what is it for when we don't seem to be actually affecting any uh of the kinds of behavioral change that we say we would like to see um i think one thing that always strikes me when we talk about you know uh, the the influence we gain um by being um great big arms dealers particularly saudi arabia um, and the argument that, you know, if the UK doesn't sell to them, we'll lose influence, we'll lose information, we'll lose sort of essential cooperation. What I find really perplexing about that line of argument is it overlooks the fact that this is a two way relationship of mutual benefit. And the Saudis aren't doing us a massive favour by <laughs> buying our arms and getting nothing in return. This is, the, you know, um, they're not, you know, <laughs> world leading philanthropists they're not doing this for the good of their health they're doing this for a good reason it's a it's a partnership of mutual benefit and I think that it's important to bear that in mind when we look at the dynamic and who is influencing who um, I think as well that Biden's change in policy will be really instructive on this question I mean to the extent that it you know really really is uh, you know to the extent that it is a different policy and to you know to the extent that the flow of arms will actually stop but if if you're selling arms to get influence and Biden actually reduces the arms is it seriously credibly anyone's case that the US will lose influence by doing that I mean I don't think so Yeah, I mean, not much to say after after those comments, just to agree with the sense that, um, you know, I feel like 
influence and access derive primarily from the compatibility of interests and not so much the value of a transactional form of, of, of diplomacy like arms sales. There's a third dimension to the value proposition of arms sales that's often cited, which is the enhanced interoperability among allies and partners for confronting uh, mutually assessed threats and, um, and adversaries. But I think this is even also overstated, but also um, understates the extent, uh, the risk that's involved with that um, in terms of what the partner's own threat perceptions uh, mean for the way that they apply the weapon. So in other words, you know, whether it's Egypt or Saudi Arabia, and I keep, I hate that we keep coming back to the, <laughs> the North Africa Gulf case studies, but I think it, they're so instructive. Um, you know, this idea that the US and Saudi should be interoperable, um, you know, relative to perhaps Iran, um, entirely overlooked that the that Saudi would be using the weapons we provided in service of interoperability for a war in which the United States had almost zero interest and in fact was quite contrary to our interests. So maybe just another thought to consider. It's a rather sobering assessment, right? That uh, that this this really just is business as usual. Um, and, uh, there's, there's a lot to take in there. Um, but this leads us, leads us to the question of, of implementation, uh, that Molly and, and others have raised and some of the, the, the questions relate to implementation and, and that, you know, there's sort of this, um, we, we can have embargoes, people can proclaim, uh, states can proclaim adherence to treaties, but then at the end of the day, Who's holding them accountable? How are they held accountable? Who, who's enforcing? There's no nobody to to enforce that, especially if you're one of the P5, right? Um, so what are the what, what are the vectors for increasing accountability in in, in this scenario? Uh, so talk to us. How how do we do that? So I, I think that as an organization that's been sort of trying to um, achieve that sort of accountability and change in policies for a very long time. Um, that th This is one we're, we're most exercised with. Um, public opinion is certainly one means of achieving accountability. But as we've, we've said, that can apply, that can have more effect in terms of getting governments to sign up to something that looks good on paper rather than um, rather than it actually implementing them. Um, we are pursuing a legal case, of course, um, uh, in, in regards to, to Yemen. Um, and we hope that these legal means can achieve some measure of accountability. It has at least um, achieve one principle that government, the UK government has to look at past records of IHL violations in assessing the clear risk threshold. Um, there's uh, uh, also a case that we're pursuing along with um, Watana for Human Rights, um, our, our fellow Nobel Peace Prize nominees um, uh, at the EC, at the Euro, International Criminal Court and with European Centre for Constitutional and Human Rights were leading that effort um, to, uh, to try and hold government officials and company officials accountable for their decisions for aiding and abetting war crimes in Yemen. Uh, I, I think it's a very, uh, it's a very long, slow process and not just getting public opinion on your side, but getting public opinion sufficiently alert and engaged and um, you know caring enough about the issues to actually hold the government to account beyond just saying yes we'll do good things we will obey all these good principles and making sure they do it um, it's it, it's not an easy matter as we have found over the last uh, 46 47 years at at cat but you know you know it's one way where, where we think that the debate is shifting and perhaps like just how horrific the Yemen war has been is, is one of the things that is shifting this debate. Go ahead, Molly. 
just one thing about the particular British context at the moment that's not directly related to the arms trade, but there is a lot of pressure on our government at the moment about corruption and about the rule of law. And there's been a recent court finding that um, the Secretary of State for Health, I think, broke the law in relation to um, procurement of um, certain equipment that was necessary for the corona response. So there is, at the moment now, um, there's quite a lot of traction behind the idea that the government should be held accountable when it breaks the law. And so even though the conflict in Yemen is, is you know, quite shamefully is, is out of sight and out of mind, um, largely in, in UK political discourse, the idea that the government should uh, respect the rule of law and an acceptance of the idea that the, this current government is not is something that is that is getting a lot of political traction. So I think now is an extremely good time for campaign against the arms trade to be making these kinds of arguments and to be getting publicity for them because there is a public appetite for that right now. You know, this makes me wonder if there's any historical evidence that this kind of advocacy has had an effect on the state behavior, right? What If we look back in, in history, um, do we see any evidence of that? This is deafening silence. <laughs> I don't mean to be on too pessimistic. <laughs> on this Emma? question, it's not. I'm. I don't really have a, an answer for your last question. But on the the question of accountability, I think that one really important point in the report is what it shows about the importance of um, how arm cells are framed, um, and because the the framing of what are arm cells for to a specific country. Um, actually reduce in some cases, uh, reduces in some cases the, the, the public opinion or the public interest in, in it. And I would argue that that is what we see a lot in, in a lot of the countries that are covered by the report is, um, for instance, the idea that um, arms will be used uh, to counter terrorists, um, to counter terrorism. This is an argument that comes back a lot in the framing of uh, arm cells is, is, I think, really important in the, the whole question of accountability. Um, and I was thinking about that because I, I, I agree with what has been said that um, what the Biden administration is doing right now is going to be, um, you know, a test uh, to these, this idea of, of uh, increased accountability. And yet we, we see that even the Biden administration, I want to say, um, when freezing support to uh, the, the war in Yemen specified that it would suspend uh, all offensive arms sales. And then that, while that brings up the question of what do, what do you actually call offensive uh, as opposed to defensive? And I think this whole question of framing is a question that will be very important to address uh, when we think of accountability. So can I offer a thought on advocacy, Nathan, if you don't mind? Sure. It's very brief. I think it's worthwhile um, both examining what advocacy has achieved, because I think in the case of the of the Saudi campaign in Yemen, advocacy did achieve much in, in terms of the, you know, on the first day of the Biden administration, obviously feeling the pressure to do something different than the, the policy sort of status quo. So that aside, um, from my experience and perspective, it's really worth examining the potential power of, of advocacy and the procedural um, possibilities that are currently available and what limitations are in place. And if you don't address some of those procedural limitations on the US side, it becomes a limiting factor for advocacy. So to put a finer point and maybe some clarity on this, this the, in the US, the Congress has very few procedural routes to actually coming between the executive branch and an arms transfer. In fact, there's only really one way to do it through a um, you know a resolution of disapproval that goes through both sides of of Congress and so it's you know it, it essentially shuts down a major avenue of advocacy um, via the the kind of the you know the, the article one power of the Congress um, leaving you know the public to either engage or try to engage directly with the executive branch or try to pursue this very narrow option uh, through the Congress which is I think all the more reason 
that a rebalancing of the um, you know, like the powers between the executive and Congress in the in the, in the case of the United States um, could yield a much better reflection of the public interest uh, in overall arms sales than currently exists because of a procedural uh, issue. Okay, so there's there's a public opinion, public interest sort of uh, vector. There's a, a procedural vector that I think are, are useful. The the framing uh, and the context that Emma talked about also also very important. Uh, there's there's one question that talks about uh, peace through strength. You know, if we if we push for the export of defensive capabilities, does that reduce the likelihood uh, that uh, a war will happen, or B that if war happens, the the arms may be used in a let's call it a responsible way, uh, or in, in adherence with international humanitarian law. Uh, so tell me what what do you think about that possibility? If 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 we do focus on defensive capabilities, and like Emma says, how do I identify what defensive capabilities are? <laughs> how do we distinguish? Sam, you're, you're muted, I think. Sam, you're still muted. It's running low on battery. Uh, so I was trying to switch to my webcam mic, but we'll just have to hope they don't actually run out. <laughs> the webcam might usually works. I think that the sort of promoting peace by arms sales is sometimes what undermined by the fact that you've often got um, the same countries or at least close allies selling to opposite sides of, of a conflict, like in India and Pakistan have both received arms from uh, most of the uh, suppliers here. Um, I mean, of course, sort of philosophically and practically, the question of um, whether you achieve peace by everyone being armed to the teeth to deter the other side, or whether um, whether you achieve peace by disarmament uh, on one or both sides is uh, that's an endless one, and usually it won't be solved because the latter has so rarely been tried. Um, I come from philosophically from from the latter point of view, and I mean insofar as there is statistical evidence, it seems to support the idea that buildups of arms are associated with a higher probability of, of war breaking out. It, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say that's conclusive evidence, but it, it is basically a matter of sort of political philosophy here as to whether you believe that you achieve peace through massive arms on either side or through trying to reduce levels of, of, of armament uh, on, on, on all sides. There's a question from uh, Bill Hartung uh, about the, you know, essentially the logic of if we don't supply arms, somebody else will. So we, we might as well, right? Um, he says that a common refrain arguing against unrestrained arms sales, uh, for example, and arguments against stopping U.S. arms sales to Saudi Arabia, is that other suppliers like Russia or China will fill the gap. What's your view of this argument generally, as well as in the Saudi case? Um, I'll well, jump in if that's okay. Um, so, I, I mean, I think an important point to make is that um, all the arms sellers are not selling exactly the same thing. And so it's not the case that, um, you know, Russia could just immediately supply exactly the same kit, exactly the same technology as the UK is currently supplying to Saudi Arabia. And that's important because the people who are using it in Saudi Arabia are, use, are trained for a very long time to use that UK supplied kit. If you take away the UK supplied kit, 
and give them something completely new, it's not just interchangeable. They can't just step out of a British supplied aircraft and into a Russia supplied one and are good to go. It's not that easy. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's important to note that there is, that, that all of this equipment is not exactly the same. And so these relationships, you can't just, you know, ping one out and ping one in. It's not that simple. Um, these relationships take, take they, they develop over years. And, uh, the, you know, the initial outlay is, is huge on, on an initial piece of hardware. That's a huge outlay. If you then, you know, abandon that, you have to make the same outlay all over again if you're going to go with a new supplier. Um, and and that's, that's a big deal, you know, rather than stick with your original one and just pay for the updates to that, which your um, armed forces are already proficient and trained in, in using. So I think that's that's one point. And then there's a second kind of moral point about this, which is if, if you're doing something wrong, um, it's like, you know, should I, should I rob a bank just because if I don't, somebody else is going, I mean, maybe rob a bank is a bad idea, it's a bad example, because, you know, maybe there's sometimes good arguments for robbing a bank. But, you know, the, the the moral point applies um if if something is wrong it's ju it's just wrong and the fact that somebody else is going to do it should not have uh, uh, an influence over your moral choices in my view okay yeah emma yeah i had um, a couple of points to that question it's an excellent question and certainly uh in in the case of the gulf states it's it's an argument that has been pushed forward not not only by uh the sellers as it turns out but but by the gulf countries themselves uh, it's uh i think um dave de roche who's uh, an expert on on arms trade to to the gulf um is mentioned pretty recently uh that every time there seems to be tension between the us and saudi arabia saudi arabia pulls uh the card of be careful, we're going to buy some S-400. And uh, that is that is an argument that really is, uh, you know, uh, used in, in times and times again. Um, what I would say cynically is that as the report um, shows, we don't really have proof that that would happen because we never really uh, stop selling arms when we do sell arms. So it's it's kind of an argument that has really never been proven. Um, and so that's a, a bit of a cynical point. The other point uh, that is, if you will, also pretty cynical is that it has been tested at least once in the case of armed drones uh, to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. and. Uh, and so in, in this case, uh, it was the United States refusing to sell arms, armed drones to, to both countries, uh, sp specifically, uh, well, not just specifically in the context of the, the Yemen war, but because of legislation, legislation on the, the US side, just preventing these exports. Um, and what happened is that the two countries turned to China to get uh, armed drones. So that has been tested, that did happen. But then I would also say that it does raise a couple of, of other questions when you when you see some of the, the, the way uh, those drones have been used in, in, this, uh, in this instance, I would think not of Yemen, but of Libya, in the case of the UAE and Libya. And so that begs the question, okay, if you have proof that if you do not sell someone else will, such as Russia or China, but then you have an example of use of that uh, material that is used in a way that is contrary to what you would have liked as a supplier, then what do you do? Do you wish that you were the one supplying it? Yeah, so there's, uh, there, there are more questions in here. And there's also the question of the startup costs that Molly mentioned for some weapon system, these might be higher startup costs than for others, right? So there's another consideration. Uh, Dan or Sam, did you want to jump in? I mean, so much has been said that I exactly have what I would have wanted to say. And of course, Bill Hartung himself is, you know, the, <laughs> the author of the best counter thesis to some of the underlying fallacies um, of this argument, but just another dimension to consider. So um, I think part of the, the logic behind this as well is that um, but for U.S. influence, um, a country that's buying weapons from another uh, country would employ those weapons in less, um, less than legal or perhaps even entirely inappropriate ways. In other words, that 
we carry with us the ability to affect the conduct um, of armed forces and the use of weapons. Um, and in some cases, I think there is some validity to that. And we don't want to necessarily toss out the entire um, you know, possibility that the U.S. does have the ability through its total package approach to influence the way weapons are deployed. But I do think that's an assumption that's worthy of like significant scrutiny, especially in the highest risk cases uh, where the U.S. may not carry the degree of influence it would like in the way uh, weapons are deployed. So maybe uh, having the role there, uh, the U.S. there as a um, as a benign source of influence on the conduct of of of, um, of the use of these weapons uh, may not be as as great as it's made out to be. And the other case study worth bringing up is, of course, didn't Nasser actually try to get away from U.S. bought weapons towards Soviet weapons? And, and I don't think that actually worked out so well for for the Egyptians in the 70s. So another uh, case study to illustrate the original point that was made. Um, I, I turned up my other mic. Can you hear me now? Yes, good. Right. Um, sorry about that. I think medium to long term, yes, it's absolutely true. If we don't sell weapons, someone else will. You can't permanently stop a country from acquiring weaponry by one country deciding to stop it. In the short term, in a case like the war in Yemen, you can US and UK between them could ground the Saudi Air Force. Um, because as Molly said, you can't replace it uh, so quickly. In, in the long term, yes, it's never going to be the case that one country stopping arms sales is going to be enough to prevent dangerous buildups of arms, buildups of arms by countries that are abusing human rights and so forth, that it's, that it's going to take um, concerted international uh, action as, as with any disarmament measure. But I, I don't think the fact that one country's action is not going to be enough is not a reason for individual countries to just carry on uh, regardless and to do nothing, as well as engaging in those international efforts uh, to, 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 to try and get more global uh, disarmament and arms control. All right, thanks. This makes me think of... Um... You know, other ways that uh, are that the transfer of arms could be controlled with more accountability or at least more effectiveness. Um, the one of the questions in the chat talks about uh, corporate forbearance. You know, so far we've spoken about state behavior and managing or moderating state behavior, but we haven't spoken much about the behavior of um, corporations, uh, the companies that produce these arms. Uh, could companies be convinced that it's not in their market interest to um, go through with a, with a sale, uh, even if they do have the authorization from a state? Uh, or are, are there other ways, are there other sort of um, arms control regimes that other countries have implemented internally that, that are effective uh, in, in, in terms of uh, reducing or reducing sales or creating a hiatus in sales uh, at, at some point. So let's, I just want to think more want to think more broadly about uh, other uh, vectors for um, increasing accountability. I mean, I can go first. Or sorry, was someone talking? Go ahead, Dan. I was just going to say, I'll just to start things off. I mean, I think someone referred to the fact earlier that um, industry carries with it currently a tremendous advantage in the way that um, arms transfers are, are packaged as serving both U.S. national security interests, but also this is again just in the U.S. case. Um, but also, um, I think they've carefully packaged certain armaments, even in this um, this artificial layer of. Um, confidence that the weapons that we're selling somehow actually preserve humanitarian uh, equities in ways. So if you look at the um, like the websites, for example, um, that of certain manufacturers um, on their precision guided munitions, I mean, they actually are are um, representing munitions as actually being of the sort that limit harms uh, experienced by by civilians in, in war and so forth. So I feel like it's 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 really hard to push back against the current narrative and the publicity that they're already taking advantage of to push it across the threshold of um, the kind of uh, negative publicity that would be required for them to make a corporate decision against, you know, shareholder interests and so forth. The one exception I can think of is actually in the realm of like cluster munitions, 
um, you know, where I think there, there has been examples where there have been examples where public pressure and notoriety got to the point where, uh, where industry actually elected to restrain itself. But I think that's a pretty exceptional uh, set of circumstances. Yeah, we, we were, I was talking with others in some forum, I don't remember which, about the potential for making a business case in some particular cases, uh, a reputational case why a company might want to stop some arms exports. I think it could only be done in sort of cases where it's a fairly small market. You're not going to be able to make a business case for BAE or um, Lockheed as, or, or was Raytheon as to why they'd be better off not selling to Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, there is no business case to make there. Um, but again, this uh, ECCHR case that we're pushing at the ICC, this is trying to uh, push the principle that private companies have a duty of diligence uh, in keeping with the sort of principles of business and human rights to um, to assess, to make their own risk assessment of the impact of their uh, of their products on human rights. And that ironically, whereas um, in so many other areas, a lot of businesses have accepted that they need to consider the impact of their supply chain and so forth, at least on paper. In the area of arms, it's one area where the actual products, where they might say, oh yes, we must make sure there's no modern slavery in their, uh, our supply chain. Um, but in terms of what happens with their actual products, that's the only area where they accept absolutely no responsibility whatsoever, because they say, oh, well, the government's done the risk assessment, we don't need to. So one of the things that this case with the ICC is doing uh, is, is challenging that idea, insisting that companies do have their own duty of due diligence, uh, aside from whatever the, the, the government may permit. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, I completely echo Sam's point at the end there that this is an unusual situation because in Britain anyway, the arms dealers can say, you know, look, we've 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 applied to the government and the government said it's fine. So who are we to argue with them, especially when the government is privy to so much more information than we are? You know, we don't have diplomatic relations with the Saudis. We don't have security services. We don't have a kind of global view on how all of this will be used. We don't have a historic relationship. And so there are kind of quite credible arguments that the arms dealers can make to say the government is better placed than we are to do this risk assessment. And they've said it's fine. So what's the problem? Um, and that I think it would be really Really, uh, a really important um, piece of action that you're taking, Sam, if something authoritative emanates from that, which does mandate the arms dealers to do their own risk assessment, that will be a, a significant change. On this, I, I mean, I fully agree. I, uh, I, I will add that um, company-based accountability will probably face the same hurdles as uh, government-based accountability that we raised earlier, which is, well, what are we really talking about? Because the companies could very well decide, and that could be a way uh, to be accountable to stop selling uh, specific systems that will be, that could be used uh, offensively and in a way that could, you know, violate uh, human rights or international, uh, international law. And, and shift their focus to uh, to defensive, uh, so to speak, uh, systems or or less or systems less likely to be used um, in 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 a way that would breach uh, international law or humanitarian law. Uh, but then it does raise the question of um, would that be enough? Because you have the whole political value of arms trade and and the 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 arms trade itself is a form of political support. And I think uh, not everyone agrees as to what the end goal is. And um, I, it, I guess this question also raises uh, more questions than, uh, than, than it has answers, pretty much as the report, I, I would argue, because I, I think there's a, a question on this actually. And I do think that it is uh, in important both for governments and companies to to really assess well 
to what extent do we like do we see eye to eye in terms of strategic objectives in the region to what extent do we want to be supportive of one country or another and in light of that how can we do this possibly not through arms trade okay we only have a, a couple of minutes left um i'm going to give each panelist uh, 30 seconds for some concluding remarks uh we'll go with dan molly emma and then end up with with sam who we started with i don't do anything in, in 30 seconds when talking so um so i'm not going to try instead i'm just going to thank uh, everybody my co-panelists uh sam uh, and nathan for for hosting this and bringing attention to an issue that is uh is really in need of it very tempted to copy Dan's homework on that. Um, I will instead say that accountability is everything. And I think if there are not criminal consequences for the individual decision makers involved in this situation, I have very little hope that it will change. Okay, well, I'm going to copy paste everything as well. Uh, more seriously, Sam, thank you so much for this report. And Nathan, thank you uh, for hosting Jeff and the forum on, of, on arms trade as well. And uh, I do hope that everyone enjoyed this report and uh, that it will get everyone excited for what comes next, uh, which are the case studies. Thank you so much. Yes, I would likewise uh, thank all, all the panelists and uh, and Jeff and Nathan hosting. Uh, and yeah, watch this space. I am really excited to see what uh, Jennifer and Anna and Emma come out with uh, in the next stage of this project. Uh, there'll, there'll be more to come from the quantitative side, hoping to sort of develop some of the econometric research uh, not of interest to everyone, obviously, for, 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 for a journal. Um, so there's more to come on the quantitative side, but I think it's the qualitative side, the case studies that are going to be really exciting. And so I am uh, look forward to three more incredibly interesting webinars on those in the coming year or however long it takes. Well, thank you, all of you. This is this has been uh, great fun. And if you haven't read the report, the initial report that Sam authored, I urge you to do so. It it really is good good reading, and it's it's pretty eye opening. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Bridget, and I'll ask the panelists to turn off their videos. Okay. Um, thank you um, to all of our panelists, to Jeff Abramson, um, Nathan, especially, I'm so pleased that you, you took up the microphone for this hosting this event. We will be sending you a very short survey. Um, it's super helpful to us. So please, if you can find two minutes to just fill it out, um, we would greatly appreciate that. And repeating what everyone else said, um, please do look at the report. If you have questions, you're welcome to get in touch with us through World Peace Foundation. And thank you to all of you who stayed with us through the program, who gave us great questions and wish we could have answered all of them. So with that, we'd like to end the program. Thank you. <laughs>